And so the Kirk, represented by Butler, and the Law, personified by our good magistrate, are led through a wilderness by a mad girl and a madam to the barren place where Jenny Dean waits, all alone on a moonless night, to meet a Byronic anti-hero, some hundred years before any of us had heard of such a creature. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Who's there? Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, hell. Who's there? And what do you want with me? Are you Jenny Dean? I am. And who are you? Just such another wretch as yourself. Predestined like the rest to evil and despair if you believe your miserable man, John Knox. Show me your face. I prefer the dark. What do you want? To save your sister's life. So do I. Then you have a strange way of showing it. I will do anything the Lord permits. Well, that leaves an awful lot of elbow room considering the range of woeful things your man permits down here on a daily basis. You're speaking of the devil, not the Lord. Well, I find it hard to tell the difference sometimes. But enough Manichaeanism. I tried to rescue your sister last night, but she wouldn't be saved. So the ball bounces back to you, Jenny Dean. How? Go to the magistrate and tell him you misremembered. What? Because Effie did tell you she was pregnant. I can't. Yes, you can. I can't see anything that's wrong in the eyes of the Lord. <sighs> did you hear that, Jenny? What was it? It's what will blow a hole through your sanctimonious forehead if you refuse to tell a little white lie to save your sister's life. If I couldn't do that to save my sister's life, I'll need do it to save my own. Well, I'll give you a minute to consider that. And I'll even count it down for you. 59, 58, 57, 56, 55. Good evening, good fair moon. Good evening to thee. I pray thee, dear moon, now show it to me. Where the hell is she taking us? To the place she said she would. Have you got well hold of Meg the Hag, dear lad? For I cannot see a hand in front of me here. Hey, who you calling a hag, you scrawny knock need oh, my fist tight around her scrawny neck, my lord. What about her moon calf? Oh, she will not run off, we'll have her more. 47. Why, she stopped. Listen. What is it? Can you know here? Now, Madge, sing loud and clear. It is the bonny bird. Will you shut her up, Taylor? Where's the sleeve? The blue. He's he's let go of me, Madge. Run for it. Run for your life. And I'll meet you in the usual place. Come here. Stop. And so farewell for now, Meg Murdochson, and farewell to Madge Wildfire, as you escape the clutches of both Kirk and Law, if only so that you may, later in our tale, return to introduce that element of jeopardy, without which no historical drama can ever please. Meanwhile, Jenny Dean's mysterious captor is running out of numbers to count. Three, two, one. God forgive you. Hell and damnation, can nothing make you lie? What's going on? The only thing that'll save your sister now is the King's pardon. And there's only one way I know of getting that. Jailer! Oh, I tripped and fell down a wee cliff, sir. Oh. So goodbye, Jenny Dean. I have to go before those idiots collect themselves. What about Effie? If you won't save her, sad to say I'm her only hope. Now it is our handsome villain's turn to escape. While the agents of morality and law fumble to find each other in the dark, and Jenny goes home alone, determined that the fate of her sister cannot be left in the hands of her wicked seducer, however besotted he may be. Jenny, he suggested that if all else failed, he would offer himself up in exchange for Effie's life. And you trust that? Pass me my Bible. But he has something to offer them. You have nothing. I have my faith, Reuben. Are you saying that's nothing? No. But why do you think the king will pardon Effie just because you ask him for it? Because he's the king, and kings are just... In fairy stories, Jenny. 
Jenny, when the real king finds out it was Effie's lover who caused a riot to get her out of prison and then hung one of the king's officers. Well, there's nothing else to be done, so it must be tried. The date for Effie's execution has been set, Jenny. I know. And you've not got time to get to London and back before she's hung. Will you pass my bonnet, please? And you won't get anywhere near him without influence. And what's that when it's wearing a kilt? Some powerful lord to approach the king on your behalf. I don't even know anybody powerful. I do. Or rather, my father did. A long time ago. So, pass me some paper. Here. Right. His name's Argyle. My father saved his life at the Battle of Sheriff Muir. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but it's all there is. So, go to his mansion in Westminster. Try to get past his servants, mention the name of Butler, and give him this. But if you'll let me come with you, there's a better chance. Without a chaperone? They ken my sister's a whore. Do you want to turn me into one too? But I'm a clergyman. That only makes it worse. Then let me give you some money so you can get a coach. You haven't got any money. You can have what I have. Here. Wouldn't it get me as far as Dundee? Well, it'll buy you some boots. True enough. And I can use them for the rocky roads. But you intend walking barefoot everywhere else. Why not? What's good enough for Scotland's good enough for them down there. But I'm thinking of borrowing a wee bit more to pay for the accommodation in London, which they say is fierce expensive. Who from, Jenny? Jenny! Oh, this is mad. Jenny! And so our heroine takes herself to the mansion of the Laird Dumby Dykes, who is, by general repute, the most tight-fisted, grudge-bearing curmudgeon in the whole of Scotland. And what are you going to London for, Jenny? To beg the King to pardon my sister Effie. <laughs> well, that's a fool's errand, to be sure. But, uh, what business is it of mine? Now you've made it clear you'll no accept my hand in marriage. I was hoping to borrow from you. Borrow? Money. <laughs> Money? For the journey, my lord. Wait there. At which Jenny's heart leaps with hope, as the Laird Dumby Dykes lugs a wooden chest over to Jenny in a cloud of ancient dust and unlocks. This, Jenny Dean, is my bank. And this is all yours if you want. Not only for your tomfool journey and your mercy, but for life. If you'll only change your mind about the wee matter of marriage we discussed yesterday. Huh? So, what do you say? What? Where are you going? Jenny! If I must walk and beg my way to London, I'd better be making tracks. Goodbye to you, sir. Jenny! Jenny, indeed. Wait, will you, for the love of God. Jenny. Have you come to mock my Tom Fool journey some more, my lord? Oh, they say you shouldn't take a woman at her first word. Aye. But you'll take me at mine, for I hate but one word to bestow upon anybody, and that's a true one. Oh, then you shouldn't take a man at his first word. What do you mean by that, sir? There's ten gold guineas on this. Take it. Only if you give it freely, knowing I will pay it back in kind and not in my person. Oh, gang where you like. Marry who you like. Marry all the butlers in the country if you want to. Just Take it and be gone out my head so I can ken some peace again. Thank you, my lord, from the bottom of my heart. And the peace of the world be with you if we should ever meet again. Take care, Jenny Dean, for the world's a terrible, lonely place where you stray far free home. And so Jenny Dean sets off on her hopeless quest. Bonneted and barefoot, with only a Bible and a change of plaid tied up in a linen bag. She makes 30 miles a day, in a time when the wretched, lawless roads make journeys by foot almost as quick and no more dangerous than coach or post horse. Have you not got any shoes that wear, Bonnie Lass? <laughs> and the further south she travelled... What you got in your head, Lass? Is that a natter of pudding? ..the more aware she became of how little she had travelled. What language you have speaking, woman? But I can't tell a word you're saying. Is it English at all? <laughs> and so to make herself less conspicuous, she hides the bonnet in her bag, and when rain and cold drives her to sleep in wayside inns, she locks herself away 
and writes letters to her reluctantly spurned sweetheart. Dear Reuben, I'm halfway now to London and have seen many strange things and been subject as much to the hostility as to the comfort of strangers. And I could wish that everything stood between us as it did before my silly wee sister committed her great sin. But it isn't, and I can't make it so, and there's an end. And I would be in as good a frame of mind as possible in the circumstances if I didn't keep hearing at every wayside inn of two women asking after me, one old and one young. And I had no idea who they could be. Jenny Dean! Yes? Do you not recognise me? <laughs> no, I didn't. Well, you saw me once, and I saw you outside the heart of Midlothian. I can't stop. I've got urgent business in London. Then why don't you get up behind me and I'll take you a bit of the way? And at that, Jenny hesitated. Time was passing. The date of Effie's execution was all too soon. And so, in desperation, she got up, thinking the risk worth the time to be gained. But soon Madge turned off the road. Where are you going? Oh, it's a wee shortcut. (laughs) Which led deep into a forest, to a remote clearing hung with slaughtered animals, where an old woman sat skinning rabbits in front of a lurid red campfire. (laughs) Mummy, is this the one that took my man away from me? Stay still or I'll slit your throat. No, Madge, it's her sister. Well, she's no so pretty as her, or me. So I'm thinking we're not going to be getting much siller off the gents for her scrawny wee body. Nah, well that's not what I had in mind. Get her down and tie her to your wrist with a piece of rope. If you say so, Mummy. And down you come, you wee fruzy. Now, hold out your hands. What do you want with me? Just let me get you tied or we'll both be in trouble with Ma. And Denny whisper to her, you barking mad slut, do you hear? How long have we to keep her, Mummy? Until her hoary sister's hung. <gasps> and after that, you can marry me? If that's what you like to think. Or maybe it's so I can have the pleasure of making sure he does not marry the hoary spongy fur. But when we let this one go... Let her go. Let her go straight to the nearest magistrate and make sure I'll be hanging by my neck for kidnap. Take her to the barn and stay with her. Can I sing her to sleep, Mummy? <sighs> Do what the hell you want short of killing her. For I will be wanting the pleasure of that myself in due course. <laughs> Jenny Dean, did you ever see such a dainty chamber? With the moon shining through the holes in the roof, mm, and the fresh straw. <laughs> Which you'd better lie down on now and gang to sleep, or Mammy will be in with your skin and knife and tack off your face. Oh, <laughs> there. Isn't he that nice? Now get to sleep. I like to sleep, Jenny, for then I dream that I'm dancing with the Lady of the Moon and my poor wee bairn that lives there with her. Um, what wee bairn, Madge? Hmm? Oh, the one that did and went to hell for it were not baptised. And while Madge Wildfire innocently snores, Jenny Dean makes her wrists bloody and raw trying to break the bones, but to no avail. And then dawn comes, finds the old woman drunk and insensible, and Madge Wildfire waking like a newborn babe. <sighs> oh, I'm awfully stiff for sleeping on this floor, Jenny Dean. I could do a stretch in my legs. Do you want to go for a walk? Aye. Oh, but my ma wouldn't let me leave you. Your ma's still snoring and will be for most of the morning by the sound air. <laughs> and how can I go for a walk with you tied to my wrist? <laughs> I could go with you. Aye. Well, I might be mad, but I'm nice stupid. How can I escape when I'm tied with a rope and you're so much bigger and stronger than me? I'm bonnier. <sighs> Come on then. And so off the unlikely couple go, 
down sun-speckled woodland paths with Madge skipping and dancing and picking wild flowers to put in her hair. Of the land, I imply this to own. The lady of beaver in diamonds may shine, but has not a heart so like some as mine. <laughs> and Jenny all the while looking for a chance to escape. Until they come to a break in the trees, through which, across some fields, they see a village with a most unusual steeple, whereupon Madge falls to her knees, whimpering. Oh, no! Oh, no, 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 no! What's wrong? Madge, what is it? That's the place. What place? Where I met him. Who? Oh, the man who said he loved me. And Mummy said I was to do whatever he wanted so we could both be rich off him. So I did. But the baby that were born didn't he breathe once. And it is buried in the churchyard there, all lonely and cold. And now Jenny hears Mother Blood approaching. Madge! Madge, you burnt brain slop! Where are you? Which Madge, in the depths of her sorrow, does not hear. Nor does she see Jenny slip the dirt out of her belt, cut the rope that binds them together and make to run, until pity overwhelms her, and she decides she cannot leave poor, mad, damaged Madge with her wicked mother. Take me to it, Madge. <laughs> Take you to what? To the grave of your poor wee bairn. Have you ever seen it? Never. He gave my mummy some siller to tack me out the wall before it were buried. Then now's your chance. Madge, you silly whore, where are you? Now, Madge. Come on, show me. And so the mad girl leaps to her feet, dragging Jenny over the field so fast she can barely keep from stumbling until they reach the church with the unusual steeple and then pell-mell up its drive, at which point the church doors open and the congregation surge out led by a strikingly handsome, dark-haired gentleman on crutches, who, for some reason, causes Madge to stop in her tracks and scream. What the hell? Madge? Oh, for God's sake. Don't, don't, don't be alarmed, good people. This poor mad girl was often before my father at the bench. Go, go home. Don't let her spoil your Sunday. Sam, bring her round the back. The lame man's servant drags Madge round to the graveyard, followed by Jenny, who sees Meg Murdockson approaching across the field and therefore prefers to keep close to this crippled man, whose voice makes her shiver, although she doesn't know why yet. What are you back down here for, Madge? Didn't I pay your mother enough? Oh, for God's sake, stop whimpering. She came to see the grave of her child. And who are you? Good Lord. Jenny Dean. How do you know my name? What are you doing here? She's a thief! Oh, you're here too. She ran away after stealing oh, all be my... quiet, you miserable hag. Whatever else this pious entity might be, I'd wager your miserable life she's not a thief. Unlike you, Meg Murdockson. What have you to do with her? She kidnapped me. I did no such thing. She was going to kill me. Won't you listen to the last? I will, Meg. Not least because I am now the magistrate of this county. What? Well... If you have me up before you, I'll be telling everyone what you have been and what you did in Scotland. <laughs> Do you think anybody around here would believe your word against the man they rent their cottages and land from? <sighs> Sam, take these two off to the village lock-up, will you? Uh, there's no fairness in this world when all the justice is owned by criminals! Oh, stuff something in her mouth, for God's sake! Now, Jenny... Shall we go somewhere a little more private, where we can exchange explanations? <laughs> <laughs>